We're continuing to talk about bifurcations in 2D, the phase plane. Remember, we did bifurcations in 1D. Last time, we talked about the bifurcation in, in 2D that are basically the same as the ones in 1D, like saddle node, pitchfork. Today, we're going to talk about something that's a new phenomena that can occur, bifurcation that can happen to a fixed point in 2D called the hopped bifurcation. So this is a bifurcation of a fixed point, the hopped bifurcation of a fixed point. Other people have worked on this, so you might see it called the, including Poincaré, like the Poincaré Andronov hop bifurcation. But Hoff's name is mostly associated with it. I think that's he's a German mathematician. Instead of one of the eigenvalues of the two eigenvalues going to zero, in this case, the eigenvalues cross the imaginary axis. So if we look at a fixed point and we're plotting the real and imaginary parts, when you've got something that's, as you vary a parameter and uh, you could be crossing one way or the other, but if they cross symmetrically, right? We have to have complex conjugate pair. At this point, we've got I omega and negative I omega. So the eigenvalues are purely imaginary. In terms of the diagram that we've written before, this would be equivalent to tau equals zero and delta is greater than zero. So you remember that diagram, delta, tau. These were the unstable spirals. These are stable spirals. And right along that line would be uh, centers and they have eigenvalues of plus or minus i omega, just purely imaginary. So as you cross that line, either going from stable to an unstable or vice versa, you could get a hop bifurcation. If you remember the glycolysis example that we did from an earlier lecture, we used the poincare ben dixon theorem to show that there was, remember we made this sort of weird trapping region and we also cut a little hole around where the fixed point was. That fixed point for the glycolysis example underwent a hop bifurcation as a parameter was varied. That became an unstable spiral and then it was surrounded by a limit cycle, a periodic orbit. So whatever this was, it became an unstable spiral. In general, when you have a, a hop bifurcation, there's two different types, just like two different types of pitchfork. There's supercritical, and subcritical. We'll focus first on the supercritical case. Supercritical case means that we'll have an unstable spiral fixed point surrounded by a small amplitude, because we're thinking just near the bifurcation point, near a small amplitude, stable, nearly elliptical limit cycle. So let me give an example. We'll later get to the subcritical and then compare them, but for now, supercritical. For the example, I'll write this in polar coordinates. Often you'd be given a system in terms of X and Y, but you can turn it into polar coordinates. This isn't necessarily the normal form, but it's similar. So mu is our parameter. That's the radial direction dynamics. Theta dot equals a constant omega plus will allow it to have perhaps a quadratic dependence on R. R equals zero is a fixed point. So that means the origin. And we could just look at the what the R dot dynamics says uh, for, for that case. We have a stable fixed point for mu less than or equal to zero, and then unstable for mu greater than zero. And what does it look like? Let's just plot it. When we go unstable, so for mu greater than zero, we'll have the phase portrait. There'll be some stable limit cycle surrounding our unstable fixed point. And things coming from the outside will also go onto this limit cycle. The limit cycle has an amplitude r that goes as uh, square root of mu and it's stable maybe i'll make this a different color just to emphasize it's a stable limit cycle it doesn't really matter what uh, you know b just sort of modifies the period we're not worrying right now about the period so this is 
basically a oscillation that's got a period close to two pi over omega, especially for mu small. So hopefully you can see where that amplitude comes from, right? If we write r dot as r mu minus r squared, then the other stable point in r is at r equals square root mu. In fact, we could put this into a phase portrait plotter. I'll do a demo where I think I'll use mu of 0.5 and I'll use b as just one. So I've transformed this already into Cartesian because at least this phase portrait plotter requires Cartesian. And if I were to show the graph the phase plane, here it is. If I start near the origin, this thing isn't integrating far enough, but you can hopefully see what's going on. Things are spiraling and they're spiraling onto a periodic orbit. So starting from large values, things are kind of coming in and for lower values, they're going out. But all you'll see is just that this looks very dark. It's hard to even see where it's going. The point is unstable, but it's things are just slowly spiraling out very slowly. So it's not exactly like I've drawn in my diagram here, but qualitatively it's the same. If we look at this in terms of eigenvalues and eigenvectors transforming into Cartesian, we get, and all we have to do is do things to leading order, just write things to leading order here. And we'll get that x dot equals mu x minus omega y plus cubic terms, y dot equals omega x plus mu y plus again, cubic terms. So then what do I get for the eigenvalues? If I look at my Jacobian matrix evaluated at the origin, which is my fixed point, this is gonna be mu negative omega, omega mu. And it has eigenvalues, lambda equals mu plus or minus i omega. So what does that mean in terms of what's happening in the complex plane of the eigenvalues, imaginary and real part of lambda? Suppose we have, we start with a negative mu. If we had a negative mu, as we vary mu, these two points, it's kind of like a root locus plot. They're increasing and going to the right starting at negative mu because of the way that we've, we've got it. Crossing this line, right? So this is i omega and negative i omega. We've got this complex conjugate pair and it's just crossing from the left half plane where we have a stable spiral to the right half plane, an unstable spiral. You could see the picture that we get if we had mu less than zero, things would be just spiraling in and like I have up there, mu greater than zero. They're spiraling to th this limit cycle. That's the supercritical. Now we'll talk about the subcritical and then compare the two. So for mu less than zero, is the limit cycle like not gonna be visible or something like that? For mu less than zero, there is no limit cycle. Okay. Got it, got yeah. it. So at mu equals zero, the limit cycle is born. There's a general rule of thumb. We've set this up so that the critical value is mu equals zero. But if the critical bifurcation value is something non-zero, let's call it mu critical, then we would have that there's a stable limit cycle it has a, it has a, an amplitude or size that grows proportional to square root mu minus mu c. And the frequency is very close to the frequency for very small mu. So it's basically t equals two pi over, and we could just say the imaginary part of lambda, basically evaluated at zero plus terms of order mu minus mu c. And I've, you know, this was contrived so that the eigenvalues are just sort of crossing in straight lines, but of course you could have the eigenvalues crossing in some weird way, but locally it'll appear straight, not necessarily uh, horizontal, maybe some.
curvature to it, but that kind of takes us a little bit too far. But yeah, the, the main thing is that a new, a, a limit cycle was born and it has the same stability as the fixed point before there was a limit cycle. So we have a stable fixed point and no limit cycle. And then after this, we have a unstable fixed point and stable limit cycle. And it's the stability of the limit cycle that leads to the name supercritical. So in this case, the uh, uh, mu greater than zero had the stable limit cycle, but you could also come up with something where the stable limit cycle would be there for mu less than zero and there'd be no limit cycle for positive mu. So the supercritical is related to the stability of the fixed point that shows up. Maybe I'll show another diagram because it, it's kind of cool. Ta-da. This is a bifurcation diagram where we've got X and Y. Hopefully you can see that. We've got X and Y. And then along this direction, mu, where mu equals zero is the critical value. So before that, we've got stable fixed point. And then at mu equals zero, the fixed point loses its stability becomes unstable. So we'll draw this as dashed. And we have a stable limit cycle, which is growing with a amplitude that's proportional to square root of mu. So let's look at the subcritical and then we can compare. So subcritical, it's sort of a big deal in terms of what it implies for the dynamics of a system, as I'll try to show you. In the subcritical, we have an unstable cycle. And so I'll draw that as a dashed line, dashed closed curve, an unstable limit cycle that surrounds a stable spiral. So if we were to put arrows on this, we've got things that are shrinking into that stable spiral. If you were to happen to start on that cycle without any perturbation away from it, you would stay on that cycle, but it's unstable. So you will just tend to peel off of it. And as you vary a parameter, the cycle shrinks. So vary the parameter, the cycle shrinks, and eventually intersects with the fixed point. And then the fixed point, in some sense, inherits the stability of the cycle. So we have an unstable spiral. And it just stays an unstable spiral as we keep tuning this. So unstable spiral at the bifurcation point, and it stays unstable. If we were to kind of plot what this looks like, in terms of a bifurcation diagram. And this is sort of a stylized bifurcation diagram where I'll call this again, mu for the parameter. We have that this is stable until we get to a critical value. And after that, it becomes unstable. I don't know how to draw that. Maybe I'll make some, this is kind of dashed. And if I were to th think of the oscillations of the unstable limit cycle, here's the amplitude of that unstable cycle. So this is the amplitude of the oscillation. This is for subcritical Hopf. If you were to just look at the fixed point, the fixed point goes from stable to unstable. So, okay, why would I say that this is in any sense you know, scary or completely different? If we compare with the supercritical, the x-axis, Will look the same. You've got a stable point that becomes unstable, but then the amplitude of oscillations grow and they're stable. So here's a super critical hop. Again, this is the amplitude of oscillations. And it might become more clear what the difference is if I tell you that um, some of the terminology used by different fields for these types of situations. So the, the super critical is sometimes called a soft bifurcation or continuous or safe. Whereas a subcritical hop bifurcation, different fields will call this hard, discontinuous. I think you can tell where this is going. If it's not safe, it's dangerous. And why is it dangerous? What's going on? Why is this considered soft, continuous, and safe? Well, if I am at, let's say I've, I've got a system where I've got some mu that's before the critical point and I'm marching along, we'll use orange. So if I'm say at this point, if I get a little bit of a perturbation, it you know, pushes me back. It's nice and stable. 
as I go along, changing the parameter. Well, at some point that fixed point goes unstable. And now I shoot up to, I don't know where, perhaps some distant attractor that could be, could correspond to large oscillations or just something far away. I've gone away from my control point. And that's why this is called dangerous. So think of this left-hand side, the varying of a parameter could be changing the speed of an airplane. And as the airplane speed changes, if this R is like the amplitude of oscillations of the wing, the wing isn't oscillating at all, or small oscillations get damped out because it's stable. And now I've crossed some threshold where now the non-moving point is the unstable point. And so any small oscillation is actually going to grow. So that's bad. Whereas on this other side, super critical, what do I have? I've got, you know, if I'm at this control point, this is stable. And as I vary, well, I'll, I'll stay on this stable branch. I'll stay on the stable oscillation. And so if I have any perturbation away, I'll just sort of stay near it. And so that's why it's called continuous, because as you vary across it, you won't see major changes, um, especially for small amplitudes. I'm still gonna be going towards something that's kind of close to the origin. Here, I don't know where this is going. It could be going somewhere bad. And I'll just give you a model of this that in some rough behavioral sense describes the aeroelastic limit oscillations of, of wings. It'll give you an idea of the dangers of the subcritical Hopf bifurcation. So this is just an analytical example. R dot equals mu R plus r cubed minus r to the fifth. And you'll notice compared to last time, I've got a plus here instead of a minus. It's actually that plus that makes this a subcritical Hopf bifurcation. And just to make life easier, I'll say theta dot equals a constant. Just make it equal to one. What do we get? In this case, for mu less than zero, greater than negative one fourth. The origin is stable. So this will look a lot like that picture up above of the subcritical. I have an unstable limit cycle, but then I also have further out a stable limit cycle. So things would be peeling off of this unstable limit cycle and going to the stable limit cycle. And things will be approaching that stable limit cycle. So we haven't really seen a system yet where we have two kind of coexisting cycles. In this case, one of them's unstable, so you're not likely to actually observe any kind of cycle. We just know there's, there's sort of a boundary that's pushing things either towards the origin or towards this outer stable limit cycle. What about for mu greater than zero? As you increase mu, the unstable limit cycle actually shrinks down to a point at the origin and turns the origin into an unstable point, but we still have this large oscillation, stable limit cycle. So if we were to sketch what's going on here in terms of a bifurcation diagram, like we've been doing kind of oscillations, and here's our parameter mu, we've got zero and then I'll do negative one fourth. The origin is stable all the way up to zero and then it goes unstable. So let's make that kind of dashed. Also at zero, we have a subcritical Hopf bifurcation. So there's a limit cycle and it meets up and merges. This one fourth is where the two limit cycles actually merge together and what is sort of like a, a limit cycle version of a saddle node bifurcation. So then we've got that. So if you now imagine what's going on if I'm, you know, at this point, much less than uh, one fourth, well, things are stable, small perturbations move me back. As I were to crawl along here, now I reach this critical point and I move to something very distant. And if I were to keep increasing this parameter mu, I'm stuck on this cycle. Even if I tried to reverse course, I'm stuck on that cycle until I get back to here. 
So this is in some sense what's going on. We're sort of giving a bigger picture of the phase space here, not just locally what's happening near that subcritical Hopf bifurcation, but that shows how it's dangerous. That as I change a parameter, I have this discontinuous jump to some very distant and maybe undesirable state, some large scale oscillation. It'd be kind of hard to plot what this is in terms of a 3D diagram. I guess we could try it. I don't know. It's like we've got some cycle thing and then it it changes. This is yeah, it's pretty hard to draw. And try to make these dashed or orange or something, red dashed. So here's what it looks like at one particular value. All right. What are the axes here? I'm plotting basically mu and then x and y. That's actually pretty good. And then this is unstable afterwards. If you want a picture of what the, the subcritical bifurcation looks like, much like I did for the supercritical, here it is. Unstable periodic orbit merges. Now going back up here, at least in terms of what the fixed point is doing and how it changes stability, these two pictures are identical. As mu goes from below mu critical to above mu critical, it looks like we went from something stable to unstable. Knowing whether or not you have a subcritical or supercritical hop bifurcation can't be distinguished from just the linearization. You need to look at the nonlinear terms. In particular, it's related to this, at least in polar coordinates, related to the sign of that cubic term. There are analytical criterion, but they are complicated. But that's kind of worth saying here that you cannot distinguish, right? Since they have possibly very different consequences for a system, you want to be able to do this. You cannot use linearization to distinguish sub and supercritical Hopf bifurcations. It's related to the coefficient of the R cubed term. We could write what the normal form is for the Hopf bifurcation. You know how we talked about normal forms for the 1D bifurcations? We could do a normal form for the Hopf. Another course whose videos I've put online, I discuss it. So if you wanted to know where it came from, but it looks like R dot equals D mu. D is a constant. Mu is the parameter that we're changing plus a r cubed. So now finding out the sign of a is very important. And then higher order terms are going to be fifth order and higher. Theta dot equals omega plus b r squared plus terms that are fourth order and higher. So that's the normal form for the hop. You can get the sign of d by which way the eigenvalues cross the imaginary axis. So that one isn't so hard. As we vary mu, very our parameter, if things are going from left to right, then this would be d greater than zero. Right? And if we have things going from right to left, d less than zero. A is a bit harder to get at. And when you're given a system, it'll typically be given in terms of Cartesian, like x dot equals something, y dot equals something. So it's a bit involved to get A. I will show it to you though, but if our system about the fixed point, meaning the origin is the fixed point, x dot equals, I'll write it this way, f1 of x and y, and y dot equals f2 x and y. I'm writing it this way just so I can match the notation of what this looks like. It, it's not particularly illuminating, but if you were curious, it involves a bunch of evaluations of partial derivatives of f1 and f2, as well as omega, which you can separately get. So there it is. This actually comes from a book by Wiggins, but you could evaluate it. I've done it for some systems. All you're finding is like the sine of A. So it's the combinations of the sine of D and the sine of A determine whether or not you've got a subcritical or supercritical hop bifurcation.